to see in the house of the Lord and it's good to be in the Lord's house it's good to want to be in God's house isn't it a lot of people don't want to be but when you get saved with the grace of God and come to know God's son the Lord Jesus you want to meet together with God's people and worship him nothing blesses a child of God anymore than coming to church and singing the songs of Zion and feeding on the word of God fellowshipping with one another, bearing one another's burdens. And it's just a joy, joy, joy to be here today. This is the Crossroads Baptist Church. This is Pastor Curtis Barbary, and we're delighted that you're tuned in today for our live streaming. We trust the service will be a blessing to you, and I, of course, rejoice in those of you who are here in the sanctuary today. Kind of difficult to preach to empty pews. That's about what we've been doing for the last little while. But thank God for you that's coming. We're having good attendance. And I praise God for it, and we're staying distant. And we may be more distant in, in, in some ways than we should be. But uh, anyway, I'm glad you're here, and we thank God for you. We don't take you for it. Granted. All right, I'm going to ask Brother Ritter to come and lead us in a prayer. And we'll get started in the service. Brother Jordan's going to sing after he prays for us. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you this morning, God. We just thank you for allowing us another day to come out and worship you in truth and in spirit. Father, we thank you for allowing our feet to touch the floor once again. We thank you for the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. We just ask you, God, to be with each one in need day and hour that we're in, God, be with those that's in the homes, the rest homes, the hospitals. God, we just ask you to reach down, touch them, and help them. Be with those families that are bereaved, God, those who have lost loved ones. We ask you to please comfort them. God, we ask you to be with this service today. We just ask you to anoint it from on high. Bless the songs of Zion that are sung. Bless Brother Barbary, God, as he brings a message to us. Just give him what you've laid on his heart, God, and open our hearts and minds to what thus saith thee. God, just watch over us and be with us. We thank you for it and what you've done, what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Did 
would say, He is a sinner, and now He must die. Then I heard a voice say, Father, I go, and I'll pay His sin debt in Calvary's flow. I'll bear in my body marks of the cross to save that child who is sin sick and lost and distill the blood that saves from sin distill the blood that cleanses within from the highest star in heaven depths of the sea, it's still the blood of Jesus that brings victory to me. There are those who rely on the works that they do. Some men count on the times they pray through. Oh, but when the battle's over and victory is won, I'll go home through the blood of the Father's precious Son and distill the blood that saves from sin. the highest star in heaven to the depths of the sea it's still the blood of jesus that brings victory to me if you have your bible i'd like for you to turn and i want to read and then jordan's going to sing another song for us i want to read in first peter today turn in your bible to first peter Chapter 1, and I want to read in chapter 1 and chapter 5 of First Peter. First Peter, chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, and that's the verse I wanted to read. And I want to read a verse in chapter 5. Now, when you study in the books of the Bible, they're like a house. And, uh, you know, if your house is locked up, most people, when you go off, you lock the house. We do our house. We lock it up, board it up, nail it up. But you have a doors on the front and on the back, and generally you'll put a key somewhere, either at the front door or the back door, you'll hide one. And I ain't going to tell you where we hide ours. It's under that rock right up next to the river. But that's the way it is with studying the Bible, the books of the Bible. There is a key verse that unlocks. The book. And if you get started off on the key verse, then you'll know what the book's all about. And you won't run every direction. You'll follow the theme of the book. I, I learned when I was going to college, I had a very wise professor. And he's given us instructions on making papers and having reference books and studying those books and reading those books and making reports on them. And he said, now, I, I, he probably don't never said this, but he did, and I caught him. He said, all books that are well written have an introduction and a conclusion. 
And he said, the introduction is like a front porch to a house, and the conclusion is like the back porch to the house. He said, in the introduction, it'll tell you what he's going to say in the body. And in the conclusion, the author will tell you what he has said in the book. Boy, I wrote that down in my mind. I've never forgotten it. And I'm 86 years old. I, I was in my 20s then. And I skipped reading a lot of books. I'd master the introduction and master the conclusion and write the paper. <laughs> I knew what to say. Of course, I didn't always make A's, but I'd done it anyway. So every book's got a, a key verse to it. It has a key. And here's the key to 1 Peter. The key's hanging at the back door. Chapter 5 and verse number 12. But Silvanus, that is Silas, who you remember was a companion of Paul, we could read it, by, but by Silas, a faithful brother, unto you, as I suppose I have written, briefly, I have written briefly, here's the reason he wrote it, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. See? He's telling you right there that he's going to write about the grace of God in that book. And in this book, you'll discover that the grace of God is sufficient. Now, while I'm there, let me read verse 13. It says, The church that is at Babylon... Now, that was not Babylon the Great as we know it. Babylon was known in the Bible as wickedness, evil. Probably he's referring to Rome. Rome was the name of Rome, of course, Rome, Italy. But it was so wicked that it was called Babylon, little Babylon. And probably he's referring to Babylon, uh, to Rome when he says the church that is at Babylon, I might substitute Rome. I don't think I'll do no harm. Elected together with you, salute you, and so doth Marcus, and that's Mark who wrote the gospel of Mark, my son, his son in the faith. So I want to preach for the next few weeks on 1 Peter. And Brother Jordan is going to sing before I preach this morning. life's blood shed for me why did he suffer like no man has ever done there's just one reason I am the one he loves me he loves Talk to Jesus. He loves. 
loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Jesus loves me. He loves me. He loves me. Jesus. you glad for the love of the Lord Jesus? First Peter has to do, the theme of the book is that of hope. And he talks about a living hope all through this book. God's people have a living hope. There are those today who have no hope. The Bible describes the unsaved man, a woman, boy, girl as without God and without hope in the world. That's sad to be without any hope. As a pastor, I have gone many times with people and stood with people who have gone to the doctor and to be analyzed and diagnosed about diseases. And the doctor would say, finally, there, there's no hope. That's sad words to receive. But there are those today who have no hope. They're without God, without Christ in this world. But the man or the woman, the boy or girl, who have reposed their faith in Jesus Christ, have a living hope. A hope that sustains them now and a hope that will bless them in the future. It is a hope for the future, a better future. The Apostle Peter, writing to believers who were severely tested because of their faith in Jesus Christ, that's what he was writing to whom he was writing. He tells them that God's grace in Christ and through Christ is sufficient for their need. You see, what had happened, these believers had been dispersed from their own homeland because of severe persecution on Christianity leading up to the time of 70 A.D. when Jerusalem would be destroyed by Rome. And many of these believers had gone to these five places that are named in verse number one. Five provinces, we'd call them counties, five, five cities or places, and these were Jews primarily who were saved but had been persecuted and driven out of their own homeland, and now they're living among Gentile people. But many of these Gentiles had been saved. God's gospel had spread from the day of Pentecost to various cities all across. Many people had come to faith in Jesus Christ, even Gentiles. And these Jews were settling down in these Gentile communities. And Peter is writing to tell them how they are to behave among Gentiles in foreign lands. This letter speaks of the grace the grief and the glory, the grace of God, the grief of these people, and the glory of God that they might experience. Grace of salvation, grief in their suffering, and glory from their sovereign. God's mercy 
meets our misery. And God's grace meets our guilt. And God's glory meets our grief. So there's three things I want to call to your attention from the, this verse. First, the penman. And second, the people. And third, the purpose. The people, the, per, the penman of this writing was Peter. The people of this writing, you'll see, and the purpose of the writing, he gives us. Simon Peter is called. He's called Simon Simon was his natural name. You see, Simon Peter lived in Capernaum. He was a fisherman by trade. He fished fished with his brother John and with his father. They had a fishing business in Capernaum. He was called a common man. He was called ignorant and unlearned. That simply means not that he didn't have knowledge but that he was not trained in the formal schools of that day. But no one could say Peter was ignorant because he sat at the feet of the greatest teacher that ever walked the face of the earth for three and a half years and not only heard his sayings, but saw his works and experienced his miracles. So Simon Peter was in a in a sense a brilliant man. He's the one that's doing the writing. That was his natural name, Simon. And his name also was Peter. And remember that Jesus gave him this name, and it signifies his spiritual nature. It came about when John the Baptist was preaching by the Jordan River and baptizing people. And among his listeners were Andrew and another companion. They listened to John the Baptist as he stood up and saw Jesus, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And they had been looking for the Lamb that had been prophesied and promised to come. And when Jesus walked away, they, Andrew and Philip, followed the the Lord Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said, Whom seek ye? They said, Master, which is to say, or, or they said, Rabbi, which is to say, Master, where dwellest thou? And he said, Come and see. And they went and dwelt with him that day. And possibly the next day, Simon Peter, uh, or Andrew says, that he went and found his brother, Simon Peter. And he not only found him, but he taught him. He said to Simon Peter, we found the Messiah of whom the prophets speak. And the scripture says, He brought him to Jesus. Now listen, ladies and gentlemen, as Christians, that's a good example for us. We're to find people where they are, and we're to teach them about Jesus, and we're to bring them to him. Amen? And that's a good example. And the Bible says that when Jesus saw Simon coming, he said, Thou art. Simon, thy name shall be called Cephas, which being interpreted is a stone, Peter the name, a stone, a little pebble, a stone. It suggests a stone hewed out of a greater stone. So his name was Simon Peter. Simon refers to his natural name. Peter refers to his spiritual name. Name. He was also, his title was an apostle of Jesus Christ, the verse says. An apostle is one sent from God as an ambassador, like we have ambassadors in America. We send them all over the world to represent our country. And Peter was an ambassador of Jesus Christ. The scripture tells us that Simon Peter 
was the apostle to the Jews. That doesn't mean he didn't preach to the Gentiles, because he did. On the day of Pentecost, he had the keys, as it were, typically, and he preached on the day of Pentecost and opened up the kingdom of God, as it were, to the Jewish world. In Acts chapter 10, at Cornelius' house, a Gentile leader, he preached there and opened up the world to the gospel, to the world, to the Gentile world. But primarily, Peter was the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul was the apostle to the Jews. They both preached to both Jews and Gentiles. After all, ladies and gentlemen, there is only one gospel. It's one gospel for one race, the human race. It's about one Savior. It's about one hope. It's about one heaven. It's about one hell. The same gospel. So he was an ambassador. He was a, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice something about the people. That's a little bit about the writer, Peter. The Peter to whom he was writing were Gentiles, saved Gentiles, and saved Jews. Both saved Jews and saved Gentiles. And he calls them strangers. And in another place, on over in the letter, he calls them pilgrims. We could say they were pilgrims and strangers on this earth, as was their Savior. The Lord Jesus was a stranger in his own earth. The disciples even asked him after his resurrection when they were discussing the death and the resurrection of Jesus. They said, Art thou a stranger and knowest not these things? John said he came unto his own and his own received him not. Jesus himself, himself said about his stay in this world, the foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. He made the world, and the world knew him not. He was a stranger in his own house. And these Christians were called strangers in these five provinces that they were dispersed to. May I remind you, if you're saved, that you're not of this world. You're a stranger and a pilgrim in this world. This is not our home. Praise God. We're just passing through. A pilgrim is here just for a little while. A pilgrim is someone who may stay for a little while, but he's not home yet. We're not home yet, children. We're on our way. We are strangers. We may be considered strangers and looked at as strangers, and that's what the Bible descri- how the Bible describes these people. They were strangers, but they were not only strangers. They were special people. They were God's people. They were God's people. You see, they are called Christians. The word Christian is used three times in the Scripture. It's used first in Acts, when the believers were first called Christians, and it's you. Peter uses the word Christian here about these believers because of their persecution. They were persecuted as Christians, he said. So a Christian is a Christ one. A Christ one. They were God's special people. There's somebody. Let me tell you something. If you're saved, you have an identity that's beyond this world, praise God. You belong to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're of royal descent. You have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as your identity to the fact that you're special. 
We're special as God's people. Now, that don't lift us up in pride and make us think that we're better than other people, but it sure does lift you up in your soul and make you glad, thank God, for your position in the Lord. They were not only scattered, or not only strangers and special, but they were scattered people, the verse says. Now, the word scattered has the idea that you'd go out here and scatter seed with the intent. I've got a wonderful son-in-law sitting down there. I'm going to brag on him in his presence so he'll do more. But my son-in-law had been scraping my yard in one place. We, we, we've never been able to get grass to grow in 35 years, and he thinks he can get it to grow. And my little dog watches him go out there and barks at him every time he goes out there. That little dog said, won't work, won't work, won't work. <laughs> but he's put seed out there, and he's worked out there, and he's watered it and watered it and watered it. And what, he put the seed out with the intent that he'll have a harvest. These people were scattered as seed. God permitted them to be scattered in five provinces among unbelievers in some cases with the intent that there'd be seed that would bring in a harvest. Do you get the point? Do you have any harvest in your garden? Any harvest? Do you sow any seed that brings forth fruit? We're to bear fruit. And that's what this book says about these people. They are people that were scattered. And they were scattered with the purpose of bringing forth a harvest unto the glory of God. So that's the people of this book. Now I want you to say a word about the purpose of this book. As I said, this book has a purpose. And as I showed you in chapter 5 and verse 12, the purpose of his writing was to encourage, to comfort, and to assure these believers in Christ. Now get the picture if you can. If I can somehow describe it. Here's these people. We don't know how many. Probably several hundred, maybe several thousand people. At least several hundred people that had been scattered out in these living in the, among strangers. Some Gentile Christians, yes, but a many unbelieving Gentiles who worship false gods, pagan gods, who hated Christianity. They were in an evil unacceptable to them society and atmosphere communities. And yet, God placed them there and the tendency would have become discouraged. So God said to Peter, you write and encourage them. I'm going to tell you something. You may have been living in an environment that is impossible. I don't know what environment you're living in, but I know one thing God knows, and God put you there. Amen? You're not there by accident or change. God put every last one of us where we are at this time. Now, God has a purpose for us there, and God don't want us to get discouraged. We have a tendency to look around and see what all the bad. Look, at, Think about them people looking around and seeing all those false gods that their neighbors were worshiping and in that environment they were living in and get discouraged. And Peter is writing this to encourage them. God's people need encouragement today. Amen? We as all need encouragement. We certainly do. Let me tell you something. Compliments are cheap, but they're valuable. You didn't get it. You're slow. I'm either a fast speaker or you're... A, a. Compliments are cheap, 
but they're valuable. They encourage. We are to encourage one another. We need encouragement from others. I had this week, I was sitting there in my chair reading, and telephone rang, and I picked it up and answered it. And it was a man, a brother from Mobile, Alabama, where I used to preach a lot. I preached there in a camp meeting every, for 25 years every March. Second week in March, I preached there 25 years straight before I got sick and things. And there's a man that used to come there and hear me preach, and his wife was an invalid now. It had been for about seven years, he said, and he had missed all the services. Of course, I've missed the last five or six years down there. And he said, Brother Barbara, I was just thinking about you and how you always encourage me in your preaching. He said, I want to call you and tell you I pray for you every day, and I love you. Boy, that, you, know, you can't imagine what that means to an old man. Somebody that way down there that I kind of forgot about, really. That's encouraging. There's somebody out there you can give a word of encouragement to. You can compliment them. That's what Peter's saying. I'm writing to you to encourage you, to encourage you, to comfort you. You're in a difficult situation. I want to tell you something. You listen to this old gray-headed preacher. We're in a difficult situation in America. It's more difficult than we realize. If we've ever had a time when we need to comfort one another, I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. I don't want to call anybody the devil, but people can be used of the devil. And the devil's behind trying to keep us separated. I don't care that no further, but just as sure as I'm standing in this pulpit, there's more to it. People are taking advantage of this virus to accomplish evil purposes and political strategies, political desires. I don't, I don't mean to be sidetracked, but I want to tell you something. We need to encourage one another. We need to get together. I mean, we need to be careful. I understand that. We need to, we need to wear masks and 45 on our side. <laughs> be a John Dillinger or somebody. <laughs> Long Ranger. No, we need, to, we need to be careful with this virus. But I'm going to tell you one thing. We need, as God's people, not to let the devil separate us. I'm afraid a lot of people who used to come to church won't be back to church no more. I believe that. We're going to be changing in church persona. It's going to change. But I want to tell you, praise God, if I can get here, I'll be here. Amen. And you ought to be here. Get in God's house. Get among God's people. Help to encourage God's people, to comfort God's people, to ensure God's people. That's what he's writing about. That's the purpose of it. <coughs> he mentions three things. God's grace and salvation. He mentions in verse 1, in verse 9, in verse 10 of the first chapter that salvation is of the Lord. Salvation is by grace. He says as much as did Paul in 2 uh, of uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, that by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works that God before ordained that we should walk in them. Salvation's by the grace of God. If you get to heaven, you, it won't be on your merits. It won't be on your goodness. It'll be beyond Calvary's merits and Calvary's goodness. That's grace. That's grace. He mentions also not only God's grace in salvation, but God's grace in submission. Now, in chapter 
uh, number 2 and verse 15, he talks about sanctifying the Lord God in your heart. Now, what's that mean? It means set aside the Lord on the throne in your heart. Let the Lord be the Lord. In other words, be submissive to the Lord. And then he goes in this chapter, and he begins in chapter 2 and verse 11, and goes to chapter 2, chapter 3 and verse 12, and he describes authorities to whom we are to be submissive to. You need to get this. This is a good time for it. We're to be submissive to certain authorities in the state. And in employment, he talked about masters and servants. And that don't mean slaves like we, ha we had back in the early days of America, no. It means common people. It means employer and employee. And God's no respect to a person. He makes that plain here. God, you see, everybody's on the same level with God. You're just a human. There's no special races with God. Special group. Israel was. The church is. That's by grace. But so far as humanity is concerned, we're all one humanity. But we're to be, un we're to be in submission to authority in the home. He talked about husbands and wives. Y'all want me to preach on that a while? I see the wives shaking their head yes and the men saying. In submission to one another. And then he talks about in the church. In other words, God's ordained certain authorities. And when we're under submission to God, we'll recognize those authorities. Authority of the state. Authority of the home. And authority of the church. The ordained of God. And that's reading... I say you have to be in submission to God. and You can't be in submission to God and be in rebellion against these. Now, as far as the state concerned, Paul clarifies on some things. And Peter makes it clear here, too, that the state has responsibility to its citizens. And never are we to be in submission to any demand of any authority that contradicts God's Word, the Word of God's supreme, and God's supreme. And when we're told to do something contrary to the will of God and the Word of God, we're to disobey it. So he's given grace to be in submission. And then he talks about grace in suffering. This letter talks about suffering. We're to suffer. As God's people, God's people suffer. And he tells us how we're to suffer. We're to find grace to suffer. We're to suffer. And see, he's talking about being suffered, being persecuted again. <laughs> They're persecuted and run out of their own homeland. And he said, you may be persecuted here in these provinces. And if so, act like a Christian. We'll get into some of that. Act like a Christian. If you are a Christian, conduct yourself like a Christian. I just believe you will, don't you? I believe if you have a character of a Christian, you'll have a conduct of a Christian. And that's what this letter is all about. And I pray that somehow the Holy Spirit will speak to us and help us to see that as God's people, God has a remedy for our suffering. God has a remedy for our needs and and God will give us that which we need. We need to trust God, people. God, you cannot, God will never fail you, to put it frankly. God is a, let, let me tell you something. God is a faithful creator. And God is a faithful savior. He's a faithful creator. Let me prove it to you very quickly. He feeds the birds. <laughs> Who made them? God made them. He feeds them. And if he takes care of the birds, don't you think he'll take care of us? And if he's a faithful creator, he's a faithful savior. 
and his grace is sufficient. Father, I pray in the name of the Lord Jesus that you'll take this message and that you'll use it to help each of us be encouraged in our own hearts to understand that the grace of God is available and sufficient to meet every situation that we may face. We thank you for the grace of God in salvation. And we thank you, Lord, when we suffer. We can do it as a Christian, and grace is sufficient to do it with honor and have the privilege to suffer for Jesus' sake. I pray you'll bless the people of this church, bless everyone, and bless their home from whence they come. We pray that you'll keep us safe, keep us doing your will, and we'll praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.